This is going to take a little while. Hopefully, hopefully it does not take too long. There's a lot of reading to do on this one. So this has to do with the FDA warning letters slash compliance slash investigations of the FDA CTP. So first thing I'm going to start, it, this is a very long article. I will provide the link underneath the video so you can read it yourself. It's a very, very long article. Very long. But we'll speak to certain areas of it. It comes from uh, Bloomberg.com, Bloomberg Politics. It says the FDA's consumer protection warnings are falling under Trump. Now, I spoke about this on the live show last night, so I want to delve into it, but then I want to get into the process with the FDA, what's going on with them. Anyway, it states the number of agency warning letters is at its lowest level since 2008. This is by, by John Tazi, I guess, uh, August 28, 2017. And let's read a little bit of this. Many aspects of your daily life, the sorts of activities and purchases you take for granted are regulated by a single federal agency. From the toothpaste you use to the lipstick you apply, the medicines you take to the food you eat, the Food and Drug Administration is supposed to stand between consumers and faulty products that could do them harm. It oversees $2.4 trillion of the US economy, some 20 cents of every dollar Americans spend. And there's the FDA Commissioner, Scott Gottlieb. But in the first months of Donald Trump's presidency, the FDA has shown signs it may be retreating from its mission. From January to July, the agency sent 265 warning letters to companies, notifying them of what it alleged to be serious violations of federal rules. That's the lowest tally for the first seven months of any year since 2008, according to a review of letters posted on the FDA's website. Compared with the first seven months of the Obama administration, that's an 8% decline. On average, it's a 30% drop from the number of letters sent during the same period of all eight years Barack Obama was president. In March, Trump nominated 45-year-old Scott Gottlieb to run the FDA. Confirmed by the Senate in May, he's embraced some muscular regulation over the past few months. The agency recently asked drug maker Indo International Placement, I guess, I don't know, PLC, uh, to take an opioid painkiller off the market and propose ratcheting down the amount of nicotine in cigarettes to non-addictive levels. But Gottlieb, who also worked for the agency under President George W. Bush, has been critical of FDA practices in the past. I mean, like I said, you could read this. Um, the link will be provided for you. <clears throat> the FDA, in response to questions about the drop in warning letters under Trump, says there's been no order to slow down enforcement and that Gottlieb doesn't plan to soften the regulatory regulators approach. FDA spokeswoman Lindsay Meyer said in an email, Commissioner Gottlieb and the FDA support and will rigorously enforce the agency's current laws and regulations. Any honest analysis of the agency's overall enforcement statistics will reflect results that are comparable to annual statistics from previous years. 
Enforcement statistics reflect actions initiated many months and sometimes more than a year prior to the reporting of the final action. So that's what I based one of the areas that I covered on the live show last night was these enforcement statistics take many months or even years, or even more than a year, to actually show up as a FDA final FDA FDA warning letter or any final actions on investigations. So just because we haven't seen any really pop up in, in regards to the manufactured finished product date products after August 8, 2016, does not mean that they are not enforcing. They may very well be doing that. It's just that hasn't popped up on the screen yet. Anyway, like I said, you can read this entire article. It's very long. Anyway, let's continue. Besides warning letters, the FDA has a variety of other tools to get companies to comply with food, drug, and safety laws. For the most serious violations, it can order recalls, seize products, and seek court-ordered injunctions. The agency obtained 17 injunctions in the 2016 fiscal year, which ended September 30th. It also has a criminal investigation office that can help initiate prosecutions. The FDA declined to provide additional data on its enforcement activities in 2017, including the total number of inspections citing ongoing investigations. Agency representatives also contend it's too early to fairly assess FDA enforcement under Trump by looking at the data it makes public. So, as you see, even though it's not, I have not received FDA warning letters like in, re, in regards to manufactured finished product dates after August 8, 2016, does not mean they're not having investigations. They are having investigations, but just not made public yet. Because normally what will happen is, and I'll show you as time goes by here, when I learn of the investigation, which is basically complete, is when I get the FDA warning letter. Because as soon as the person or persons or companies, importers or exporters or domestic manufacturers, retailers, whatever have you, once they do not comply within 15 working days of, the, of that FDA warning letter, they go to court. And they have done their entire investigation already. So they present that evidence to the court. And I'll show you all that as we go along here. So they very well are doing these investigations. Just because it hasn't been made public, has not been made public through an FDA warning letter, does not mean that they have not been doing these investigations. Now they have been. I have been, and I have put them up on the uh, FDA Final Rule channel, as well as the Make It Right Series channel, of FDA warning letters regarding selling e-liquid to those under the age of 18. But as time goes by, 2018 is going to be a very interesting year in regards to the FDA warning letters. And any of these, on, quote, on, ah, quote, ongoing investigations, unquote, will begin to appear in those emails slash FDA warning letters that I received in 2018. They will start to pop up. Anyway, let's continue. Nevertheless, warning letters remain one indicator of the agency's enforcement intensity. Any slowdown will be consistent with reports of diminished activity by, activity by other federal agencies since Trump who campaigned on the promise of cutting regulations to office. And then they got into some other areas like the EPA and things of that nature. Like I said, you can read this anytime you like. The FDA conducts thousands of inspections each year in the US and globally 
sending companies detailed observations of possible violations. And I will show you this in a moment. If manufacturers don't address serious problems, a warning letter may follow. Sometimes months or more than a year after inspectors first find something wrong. So like I said on the live show, it could take up to a year. Could take them, well, months or even more than more than a year for them to, like in, in my particular instance, like Van de Vape complaint, vaporize nomad complaint. I know they acknowledge those two complaints. Uh, the multiple multiple vendor complaint, I've yet to get an acknowledgement on I expect that in about another month or two. It takes about two and a half months for them to actually acknowledge it and that is open up the package the envelope and then send me an email saying that they have read it um, as well as the Zen Vapor um, complaint. So it could take more than a year, more than a year for them to do these investigations, even on my own complaints, let alone all the other complaints and other sporadic investigations that the FDA slash CTP do on their own. Anyway, let's continue. The letters are a potent tool to alert both companies and the public to trouble at manufacturing plants or other sites. The agency's policy is to post all warning letters publicly with the most published within a few weeks of having been sent to the target company. And that's usually what happens. Sometimes I even get it the same day, the same day that the company got it. I got, I got the FDA warning letter and email. And then it goes through some little stuff with Frito-Lay. That's the building, that's the White Oaks campus building, FDA headquarters in White Oak, and some other stuff. So they go after a Chinese dental implant maker. They went after them. It says, uh, one FDA official whom the agency allowed Bloomberg to interview on the condition he wouldn't be identified said, there is natural variation in the pace of enforcement activities and that the FDA prefers to evaluate its performance with a full year of data. So they tend to wait a whole year to know what's going on. That's why I, I say in the year 2018, we'll have a very good idea of what they've been doing with their investigations throughout the year of 2017. And then in the year 2019, well, we will have a very good idea of what they did in the year of 2018. Warning letters represent one of their more forceful instruments to use in trying to assure high quality manufacturing processes. And this is you know, in regards to medical products, but it's relative to us as well, believe me. I'll show you that in a moment. He said the number could decline for many reasons and didn't necessarily reflect a drawback in enforcement. Another potential contributor to a dip in regulatory activity may be tied to the administration's slow pace in filling federal posts, a former FDA official said. Pending matters from a previous Administration are also sometimes delayed, said Joshua Schorfstein, the first FDA political appointee under Obama. There were definitely some enforcement actions that were held up for me to review in 2009. So maybe they're filling spots, or whatever have you. I know they lifted the hiring freeze about a couple months ago. The change in warning letter activity this year hasn't been uniform across the FDA. The regulator operates through a network of district offices and several national centers focused on specific industries, 
such as drugs, medical devices, food, and tobacco. And we should know, unfortunately, by now that we fall under tobacco. Activity varies across these units according to FDA data. And then it shows about medical devices again. Um, you know, I have to go into too much of that. Like I said, you can read this as you as you please. There's some fruit contamination. The FDA is a sprawling agency beyond its White Oak, Maryland headquarters that operates in 19 district offices across the U.S. and Puerto Rico. These outposts are empowered to issue a warning letters regarding food, drugs, devices, and other products regulated by the agency, like tobacco, paper products. So far, they have issued more than half of all agency warning letters in 2017. But their numbers have dropped as well. In the first seven months of this year, district offices were responsible for 168 letters, compared with 228 over the same period in 2016. That's a 30% decline, the same percentage drop for the agency overall from the average January to July pace in all eight years of the Obama administration. Now you have to understand though, you have to understand that the 2007, so, two, the 2017 investigations will not be available until the year of 2018. Remember what they said above? Goes through some other little things here. The pace of warning letters this year seems to match the pace set during the administration of George W. Bush. On average, the agency overall issued 251 warning letters in the January to July period of each year between 2005-2009, close to the 265 issued overall this year. Warning letters prior to 2005 are not archived on the FDA's website. I'm sure you can get them through the Freedom of Information Act, but it takes a little time to do it. And then a little bit more. Stop there. Beyond warning letters, there are other ways in which to view FDA performance. One data set the agency publishes tracks the number of citations issued by inspectors, and that's what we're going to get into. You can click on all these little hyperlinks here and they will take you right to places I want to. Citations are observations recorded to alert companies about possible problems in manufacturing, food safety, safety, or other areas. They don't necessarily constitute violations and usually come before warning letters. Like the inspector inspects you, gives you a citation. Citations reported in the first quarter of 2017, the latest period available, appear to be down significantly compared with recent years. But there are important caveats. Citations made during inspections that could lead to further enforcement actions are withheld from published data until cases are resolved, the agency says. Data for recent months, therefore, may undercount the number of citations actually issued in that period. The agency declined requests for additional data to, to gauge the number of inspections performed and citations issued in 2017 because, like they said before, there are ongoing investigations. So we won't really know what's going on in 2017 until 2018. In written testimony for his confirmation hearing, Gottlieb pledged to run the FDA as an impartial and passionate advocate for public health, guided by science. He said the FDA's enforcement, 
enforcement tools are a bedrock of, it, of its mission. This guy. These initial numbers, however, ha have watchdogs such as public citizens, Hiromi, I guess, worried that Trump's pledge to roll back red tape has reached the FDA, potentially endangering Americans who rely on the 17,000 employee agency to protect them. 17,000 employees, and they're hiring more at the FDA. I think there's little reason to believe that overall, the industry is doing dramatically better. That's unlikely to be the explanation of the drop in these numbers. That was the end of that. So the point of what's going on in here is that what's going on, as far as anything, as far as manufacturing finished product dates after August 8, 2016, you have to take that in consideration. Yeah, what you have to really consider is that Judge Amy Berman Jackson's federal court decision didn't come out in regards to the Nickel Pure Labs case until July 21st, 2017. So any kind of investigations now that the FDA CTP knows where they stand out with the law, from July 21st, 2017 to December 31st of 2017, those investigations that are going on, we won't learn about them until the year of 2018. So you have to take that in consideration. So in 2019, we will have a very clear picture as to what they were working on in regards to investigations throughout the year of 2018. So 2018 and 2019, especially 2019, is going to be a very interesting year. So let's go to the other areas I want to get to. So let's try to understand what this means, warning letters. Warning letter, warning and untitled letters. Let's make that just maybe a little bit bigger if we can. Let's see if I can do this without going off the page and I can't do it. Okay, so I have to have to leave it like this. Hopefully it's big enough for you guys to, to read it. Background. In the event of a violation of the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, depending on its nature, FDA may give individuals and firms an opportunity to take voluntary and prop action to correct the violation before FDA initiates an enforcement action. FDA will issue either a warning letter or an, uh, an untitled letter to individuals or firms notifying them of such violations to allow them to voluntarily comply with the law. Warning letters are used for violations that may lead to enforcement action if not promptly and adequately corrected. Untitled letters are used for violations that do not meet the threshold of regulatory significance for a warning letter and request correction of the violations. Unlike a warning letter, an untitled letter does not include a statement that warns the individual firm that failure to promptly correct the violation may result in enforcement action. So you may get an untitled letter you know, to correct the situation, but it probably you won't be taken to court over it if you don't comply. On the other hand, a warning letter means you're going to court. FDA generally is under and this is very important, by the way. FDA generally is under no legal obligation to warn individuals or firms about violations before taking enforcement action. So if they really wanted to be a prick about it, they don't even have to issue an FDA warning letter, dependent upon how severe it is. So let's say you're at a vape shop, an inspector, undercover inspector, 
And I was saying this to Raping Minuteman on his live show. They, the FTA, CTP, actually hires 16-year-old kids to go into a vape shop and buy e-liquid. Absolutely. People think, well, maybe a 40-year-old inspector dressed up to appear like a 16-year-old is going into these vape shops. No. They actually employ a 16-year-old undercover agent to go into a vape shop. And let's say this 16-year-old buys a liquid or a hardware, a two mech mod, or whatever it may be. That's very severe. And what they could do is not say a word. The individual leaves the shop and goes back to the FDA, reports whatever the observations is, whatever happened. And the FDA decides, well, you know, it's so severe, I bet they've been doing it. Or maybe they might even go the route like send maybe 10 16-year-olds in there over a period of a year, I mean, over a period of a week. And these 10 individuals have the same problem. All 10 16-year-olds have been able to get e-liquid from this one vape shop. Well, they're going to take your rear end to court. Probably criminal court for that matter, without an FDA warning letter. So it depends on the severity of the case. Normally, normally you get an FDA warning letter. Normally. Like it says, generally, okay, so most of the time they issue these FDA warning letters, but they don't have to under the law. FDA currently posts warning letters on the FDA website. That's it, man. I get them in emails once a week. And if FDA can determine that a firm has fully corrected violations raised in a warning letter, FDA will issue an official closeout notice that also will be posted online. And they have a column for that. If requested by a recipient of a warning letter, FDA will post the company or individual's response to the warning letter on the FDA website. That's so only upon request. Summary of public comments. Individuals and consumer groups suggested that FDA disclose all warning letters and untitled letters issued by the agency. And they argued that the public should be informed about firms FDA had determined are in violation of the law and the rationale underlying FDA's determination so that members of the public can make more informed decisions about FDA regulated products. Considerations. The task force considered the utility of educating the public about volatile practices or conditions at firms that market and or distribute FDA regulated products and alerting to the public alerting the public to these practices or conditions. I don't have to get into that too much. And then they, this is like public comment stuff. Don't really have to get into any of that. The main thing is, is these FDA warning letters. They can give you an untitled um, letter. Or it's basically a citation. Or give you an FDA warning letter or not give you any notice of the FDA warning letter and take you right to court. Now, the next document is an actual manual for investigators. This comes off the FDA website. It took me a little time to find this, but finally found it. If you're hired by the FDA, CTP, but mainly from, by the FDA, if you're hired by the FDA as an investigator, you are given this uh, 539 page document to read and make sure you learn it before you go out to the field. So this is up to date, 2017. I'm not going to read the whole thing, of course. It'll take us about four days to do that. I have certain sections. 
and you're going to see right here, Investigator FDA, Office of Regulatory Affairs, Office of Operations, Investigations, Operations Manual 2017, Just do that right there. So, this is a little bit. The Investigations Operations Manual, IOM, is a primary operational guide for FDA employees to perform field investigational activities in support of the agency's public health mission. Accordingly, it directs the conduct of all fundamental field investigational activities. Adherence to this manual is paramount to assure quality, consistency, and efficiency in field operations. So let's get down to page 47. It's a little too much. Okay, so right about, right about in here. Only going to speak regards to vaping, what's in relation to us. So, if you go to 2.2.1, Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, that's what it reads. This act is amended, and its regulations provide the basic authority for most operations examinations, investigations, and samples. Collecting samples is an important and critical part of FDA's regulatory activities. While inspections and investigations may precede sample collection, a case under the law does not normally begin until a sample has been obtained. Proper sample collection is the keystone of, of effective enforcement action. So let's say someone goes into a vape shop, or even maybe they're doing an investigation of a website. They'll actually purchase an e-liquid as a sample. And then they'll take it back to the CTP, to the lab, and take a look at it. it has nothing to do with the PMTA or anything. Maybe they're looking for adulterated or misbranded e-liquid. Under the FDA final rule, misbranded slash adulterated e-liquid can lead to criminal prosecution. The basic authority for FDA to take samples falls under the statutory provisions of, and you see it, which authorizes examinations and investigations for the purposes of this act. For tobacco products of the FDNC Act directs FDA to contract with states to inspect retailers within that state in connection with the enforcement of the act when feasible. So the federal government, the FDA slash CTP, will work hand in hand with the states to do their investigations and inspections. And then this particular section of the FDNC Act, the Food, Drug, Cosmetic Act, requires FDA to furnish upon request a portion of an official sample for, for examination or analysis. So they're analyzing e-liquids. They're probably analyzing hardware as well. All this stuff will come out in the year 2018, 2019 in these FDA warning letters that I receive, or anyone can receive for that matter. Anyway, a portion of an official sample for examination and analysis to any person named on the label of an article, the owner thereof, or his attorney or agent. And they cite a slew of cases that permits them to do what, they're, what they do. That's 2.2.1.1, authority to enter and inspect. Authority to enter and inspect. 
provides a basic authority for establishment inspections. This authorizes you to enter and to inspect at reasonable times, within reasonable limits, and in a reasonable manner. Establishments or vehicles being used to process, hold, or transport food, drugs, devices, tobacco products, or cosmetics. The statute does not define in specific terms the meaning of a reasonable. FDA's establishment inspection procedures maintain this authority extends to what is reasonably necessary to achieve the objection uh, to achieve the objective of the inspection. Sorry about this. It's three in the, almost three in the morning here. So, according to whatever inspection they're doing, they will be courteous, you know, reasonable. That is, you won't even know it's he, he or she is even inspecting your establishment. They'll be real polite about it, I'm sure. Very quiet. Hi, how are you doing? Nice shop, beautiful shop you have here. Uh, can I have uh, one of those e-liquids? And can I have a tube mech on there? I think, what is that called? Tube mech? Okay, I'll take a tube mech. I'll take one of those. Verbal, is that a verbal monitor device? I'll take that. I'll take that little RDA over there, the RDA and the tank over there. And he or she will pay the bill, walk out the door, go back to the FDA CTP, and analyze every single item this person just purchased. Let's go around to page 48. One second here. Go back down to page 48, 2.2.1.5. Limitations. That particular section of FD and C Act provides authority for FDA to conduct inspections of factories, warehouses, establishments, and vehicles, and all pertinent equipment, finished and unfinished materials containers and labeling therein were food, drugs, devices, tobacco products, or cosmetics are manufactured or held. This section does not include a provision to inspect records within those facilities except for inspections of prescription drugs, non-prescription drugs intended for human use and restricted devices or tobacco products as stipulated by, as stipulated in, and they give you a section to look into. So they can maintain even records if they like, according to this particular section here. The key to here is the FDA can do all this stuff here, or manufactured or held held, meaning you have it in your inventory, finished and unfinished materials. I always hear people talk about, oh, I'm working on a uh, RDA, it's a prototype. Well, that's considered an unfinished material. Not only factories, not only warehouses, establishments could be vape shops that make their own e-liquid or like vaporized nomads, I hate to bring him into it, but perfect example, he's a manufacturer. That's considered an establishment. And they can also do the vehicles. They can inspect vehicles. Maybe you're loading up a vehicle with all your nicely well-wrapped packages to be sent off around the world. They can inspect that as well. They all inspect all the containers, finished unfinished materials, or in other words, everything, as well as labeling, even on your labels. So it mainly has to do with warning requirements. It does not have to do with design of the label. And it regards tobacco products, which we definitely fall under, unfortunately. So let's skip down to a page. Oh, let me see if I have to. Yeah, that's it. 
So let's stick, skip down to page 170. So this basically gives you an idea of the mind, the mindset of an inspector, an investigator. Get an idea of how they're thinking. So if we go down to page 170, 4.5.5.3.8, Center for Tobacco Products. And just a little thing here. Do not collect samples of tobacco products or vapor products unless directed by an assignment approved by the Center for Tobacco Products, Office of Compliance and Enforcement, or by district management. Send compliance and surveillance samples to Southeast Regional Laboratory, Atlanta Center for Tobacco Analysis. So let's say, like I said before, an inspector goes into your vape shop. You think he's, you know, maybe dressed like me. No would think, well, maybe, well, I shouldn't even say that because some of you guys probably think I am an FDA agent. <laughs> well, anyone, anyone in your neighborhood, maybe who knows, maybe there was someone's working, someone lives in your neighborhood that actually works for the FDA CTP. Just blow Joe, you know. Jane Doe, John Doe, walks into a vape shop. And you think he's a customer or she's a customer. And they buy an e-liquid. Just out of the blue. They might even say, is this a house brand e-liquid? Is this made on the, on the spot? And the person will say, yeah, this is, uh, this is our own e-liquid. Doesn't say a thing. Doesn't make an issue out of it. Doesn't question. Just buys the just buys a product or buys a tank or an RDA or whatever. And if it involves an investigation or inspection of this particular establishment, they will take it back, whatever product, they'll pay it, taxpayer money paid for by you and I or whoever, right? pay for the product to walk out the door like, you know, just Joe Blow or whatever. Drive or however they get back, you know, they go back to their, uh, the CTP, and then it goes over the samples, go to the this particular laboratory, Southeast Regional Laboratory, and Atlanta Center for Tobacco Analysis. They take it to a lab, and they check it out. Check it out. And they're looking for things like adulterated e-liquid or misbranded e-liquid. Or maybe they're looking for two vet mods that might be having problems. Maybe, maybe you know, I can't remember what it was. I think it was the uh, rig version 1 or the rig version 2 uh, with that knucklehead that had it explode on him because he didn't know what he was doing and he wound up in the hospital. Maybe the FDA went to a vape shop and purchased the rig version one and rig, rig version two. In fact, purchased the rig two mech mod, hybrid two mech mod from the same vape shop that this guy that wound up getting hurt purchased from the, that exact vape shop. The FDA goes into that exact vape shop and buys it, takes it back for analysis, and studies it. Who knows what's going on? You know, you no, know, I'm not religious at all, but they, they, the saying is, God works in mysterious ways. The federal government or government in general works in mysterious ways. You know. You always hear about the NSA and the FBI and the CIA and all these other characters always doing these, how do you say that word, um, clandestine kind of operations. You don't think the FDA does this? They do it all the time. They go into a vape shop. They buy e-liquid, walk right out the door. You think he's just a regular customer. You're, you're happy the person, you, you made a sale. 
And then all of a sudden, maybe maybe months later, weeks later, or whatever, you get an FDA warning letter on that one bottle that you sold to this particular person who wound up really being an inspector, an investigator. Anyway, let's go down to page 308. So go down to uh, this page 308, 5.8.2. Tobacco inspections. When you see tobacco, it means us too. Don't think, well, it's he talking about it's talking about tobacco no vapor products were controlled under the tobacco control act as far as the fda ctp is concerned vapor products be it e-liquid or hardware or software is considered tobacco period so it says for the first few years inspections involving tobacco products at manufacturing facilities should be made pursuant to an assignment until a compliance program is developed. CTPs or Center for Tobacco Products, Office of Compliance and Enforcement, and Office of Regulatory Affairs, Division of Medical Products and Tobacco Program Operations are available to work with the field during inspections. Additional guidance on newly deemed tobacco Products can be found on CP, CTP's deeming webpage, and you can go there if you like. Retail compliance, uh, this is 5.8.3, retail compliance check inspection contracts. FDA issues contracts to assist with compliance check inspections of retail establishments to help enforce the youth access and advertising regulations that took effect on June 22nd, 2010. Now remember, Scott Gottlieb about, I don't know, a few weeks ago, started this whole thing about youth, youth access. And we're thinking, well, this is something new, a new program coming out in the year 2018. It's been around since the year 2010, guys. FDA has a goal of establishment of establishing a contract where physical ah, FDA has a goal of establishing a contract where feasible with every US state and territory, but some states and territories, for a variety of reasons, have been unable to do so. Therefore, FDA has awarded contracts to third party entities that are able to hire commissionable inspectors to do compliance check inspections of tobacco retailers in those states and territories where FDA has not been able to contract with a state agency. FDA has further expanded this program by awarding retail inspection contracts to tribes that's Indian tribes, by the way, to conduct retail inspections within their jurisdiction. jurisdictions. In addition, FDA may also conduct its own investigations using FDA personnel, as I went through already. So they contract with the state agencies. And if they're unable to contract with the state, they get third parties involved as liaisons for those states. So let's say FDA wants to go into the state of, I don't know, Idaho. It could be anywhere, Maine, doesn't matter. Idaho says, wait all the year. You know, mm, I don't know. You know. We're a little bit more liberal minded, or you know, we don't like to have our vape shops inspected. So the FDA says, Oh, come on, okay, I'll, we won't bother you. So the FDA goes. To a third party who can work with the state and then report that third party reports back to the FDA. They still get the same, uh, you know, the objective is still met. 5.8.4, a little thing guidance, compliance, and regulatory information. 
The Center for Tobacco Products website contains resources for legal, regulatory, and policy issues related to tobacco products information for small business assistance, in case you were interested. So we'll go down to 356, page 356. I want to go. Let me finish up on that real quick. Uh, 309 or something I wanted to speak to real quick. Make sure I have that. Yeah, okay, I got everything. Never mind. So well, let's go down to 356. It's not too much left. I told you on the live show, this is going to be a long one. But this gives you a real good idea as to what is going on. So let's get into subject. Ah, I am very tired. Sorry about this, guys. I did two live live shows back to back. I did, I did the Make It Right series live show. I did the Vaping Minute Man live show. Four hours on them, and then it's 2:45 a.m. and my everything is starting to slur here, so you're going to just have to bear with me. So, subchapter 6.1 imports, 6.1.1 authority, and then you see the section of the FDNC Act authorizes FDA examination of foods, drugs, cosmetics devices and tobacco products offered for entry into the United States. And then you can see that. It says right here, 19 Code of Federal Regulation 151.4 of the U.S. Customs, Border, Customs and Border Protection Regulations authorizes employees of FDA to examine or take samples of entry goods released under immediate delivery. So the Customs Border and Protection Services, that I've said many times, they work hand in hand with the FDA, with the Homeland Security, and then eventually with the alcohol tobacco firearms, who actually enforce, literally go and you know, knock on your front door with a arrest warrant. But anyway, um, are really are the ones that enforce it. But anyway, the FDA works with the Customs Border Protection to take samples of things coming from other countries into the USA. That's what they do. They take samples. Understand? And then it goes through all of the areas. And of course, we are here. It says the procedures, let's see if I can move that out of the way. The procedures outlined in this chapter cover imported goods subject to, but not limited to, the following acts and regulations. And of course, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. And then if you go down to number nine, Family Smoking Prevention Tobacco Control Act which is what regulates us. And then they go into the whole area. 6.1.2, import investigations. Import operations normally focus on entry review, field examinations, and sample collections. So maybe they're taking, I'm sure they're taking, not even maybe, they are taking Inigan products, Aspire products, just like they would walk into a vape shop and buy some e-liquid to analyze, they're going to do it with all these other products that are coming into the USA. However, investigations are an essential tool in uncovering and developing evidence, documenting violations such as entry misdeclaration, product substitutions, port 
shopping. Like in other words, you know, you always hear, well, we can switch it. You know, maybe make it appear as a flashlight. So we'll have five boxes come at the same time. You have the firing switch to a tube met mod. You have the tube in one box. You have the firing switch in another box. You have uh, the 510 apparatus in another box. Well, they could definitely, that would be definitely coming under entry miss declaration. Because you're making it appear that it's just a, a pipe in this one box, some firing switch in another one. But really, whoever gets it in the end, whoever it's mailed to, will take all three boxes and put the device together. That's a, a missed declaration. Now, as for port shopping, I don't know exactly what that term means, but I'm sure they do. And that's all that matters. I guess so you shop around the ports. I don't know. Whatever it is, it's a legal activity. I can guarantee that. Then it says invaluable sources of information include import alerts, assignments from headquarters or other districts, districts, interagency cooperation, and local intelligence. Now, this, this is very important. Interagency cooperation, cooperation, Homeland Security, alcohol for tobacco, firearms, and uh, Custom Border Protection Services. Yes, absolutely. In fact, even the Interpol, Interpol, you ever hear of Interpol? I, I N T E R P O L. The the international police, they actually get involved as well. Absolutely. And then, of course, the FDA, the CTP, and whatever states that the um, import products were actually being sent to, the states can get involved as well. That's interagency cooperation. And then also you have local intelligence. You know, people think we just have police officers. No, there are actually individuals that work in police departments that strictly have to do with intelligence work that report to the CIA, to the FBI, NSA, whatever have you, or to the ATF or the FDA or CTP or whatever have you, to the uh, CBP, uh, Custom Border Protection, the ATF, Homeland, all work together. When documenting these situations, your supervisor may request a memo of, of investigation or an establishment inspection report to be sent to the compliance branch, in our particular case, the Center for Tobacco Products. When examining, sampling, or following up on refused imported products, you may use an affidavit to document to document the facts surrounding the situation. So, as I like to say, refused imported products. Whoever is involved in the inspection or investigation can also apply an affidavit to prove that this particular sample or examination or follow up or whatever have you is um, oh, is illegal or should be refused. 6.1.3, investigations involving the importation process. During the importation process, the FDA personnel encounter attempts to bypass proper FDA record review, inspection, and or sampling, as well as the willful attempt to import goods known to violate the act. I know many people do that companies as well. In addition to FDA detention, refusal, and placement onto an import alert, FDA performs investigations and forwards the evidence collected to support a recommendation for Customs Border Protection sanction under Title 19, which include administrative seizures, meaning the administration itself can seize the product. 
civil money penalties, which can add up to a lot of money, revocation of conditional release privileges, meaning that if there's any kind of release, maybe have a release privilege. I mean, try to try to get a visual for you. Say Inikin sends, I don't know, some verbal wattage device to the United States. There's an actual um, person that works in, let's say, the New York port. The, the, let's say it comes through the shipping. Okay. So in the shipping ports, there is actually a liaison person that works there specifically for Inikin that works specifically with the Customs and Border Protection Services and signs off all signs off on the doc, signs off on the documents that these Inikin products have been approved to come into the USA. On the other hand, like it says, this conditional release privilege, the pr the privilege of this particular liaison person can be revoked if they find out that Inikin is violating the law, which, by the way, they are. And then you have bond actions, liquidated damages, increases the bond amount, requirement of single transaction bond. So you can wind up having to pay many bonds. 6.1.3.1, import violation patterns. And I won't get into too much of this, but just a little bit so you get the, the depth of some of it. And then the below investigational points should be covered to promote a thorough investigation. Now, remember, this manual is written for an employee of the FDA CTP, but mainly of the FDA. You have to remember who is this for. It's not for the public. It's not for you and I. Took me a little time to find this thing, but I was able to find it on the FDA website. The key is, is this is for an employee. See, so when when you know when they're writing this, you're speaking to the employee. Understand? Any given situation may overlap into more than one pattern. And so they go through the whole thing again, and they cite to. Uh, what's that internal operational uh, investigate investigational operation manual I guess I can't remember what it was the last one. anyway so then they explain I'm not going to go through all this failure to hold and then they explain substitution they explain what all this means what it all means now we'll do a little bit like on the failure to hold let's just do that Failure to hold means that the goods have been distributed by the importer or consignee. The consignee is the liaison person with an, without an FDA release for import status. Please note that this is a this is defined as dis distribution without a release, not merely moving the goods outside of the port area. FDA personnel may encounter this situation at various points in the importation process, including initial exam inspection, sample collection, audit, sample collection, reconciliation examination after a health hazard finding, <clears throat> verification of reconditioning, and refusal verification. And it goes through the whole thing. I wish I could share this. PDF file with you, but uh, you have to find it. Just put the just put down investigation operations manual 2017 uh, FDA in your Google. It'll probably bring it up. And then it goes into other areas. It just defines all this. But I'm not going to go through all this because it takes me forever to read this thing. So let's go down to 366. Well, it's going to be a long one. I try to make it short, but oh well. If guys are really interested in this stuff. You'll stay with it. People that should be really interested in stuff like this is like Jay Hayes or Vaporized Nomads or uh, 
suck my mom, uh, Matt, or uh, Tony B, or Mike Fabes. These are the guys that really should be, et cetera, et cetera, should be really interested in this because this is going to come to very close to home soon. 2.78. Okay. So we want to go to. Okay. Want to go to 6.2.7.8. Procedure after hearing, this is all about importation and all this other stuff. Uh, 6.2.7.8, procedure after hearing, refusal of admission. When the importer requests the district issue a notice of refusal of admission, or the district decides the shipment still appears to be in violation, the importer, owner, and consignee were applicable or issued a notice of refusal of admission. On this notice, the charge or charges is stated exactly as shown on the original or amended notice of detention and hearing. A copy of the notice is also sent to the Custom Border Protection Services. The notice of refusal provides for the exportation or destruction of the shipment so they can send it either the Inican product back to uh, the Inican product back to Inican or destroy it. Under Custom Border Protection Services supervision within 90 days of the date of the notice or within such additional time as specified by CBP regulation. Under under OASIS, that's uh, apparently some kind of program, the notice will also contain language which includes reference to the requirement for re-delivery and contain all the above required information concerning the product and charges. The FDA file remains open until the district receives notification indicating the goods were either destroyed or exported. When they say district, that means district court. Actually, I should have shown where that's at real quick. But anyway, an FDA is responsible for the protection of the U.S. public regarding food, drugs, cosmetics, and tobacco products, etc., until the volatile article is either destroyed or exported. Let me find out. Let me show you what they, what they mean by district. I did this on the FDA found all, all the ports and that are involved. Um, anyway, the district means the district it means a court. I'm not going to be able to find it, but when they talk about the, the district, you see the, they mean, well, anyway, it means the, it means the actual, it uh, means a court. Anyway, let me go continue on. Uh, so, 67.
this goes through all. The entire process of what happens to an imported product that is illegal. It's amazing. I mean, they spell it out for the employee, whoever gets hired, of course. So I'm trying to find 367. See here, let me see if maybe this is like here it says here. Here you go. See. Notice to other parties will be made where appropriate. Copy will be retained in the district files. Response hearing to notice of detention and hearing. See, that's what district files mean. This is in the court. Could be a federal court, could be administrative court. Yeah, see, there you go. It says the notice will specify the nature of the violation charged and designate a site for the owner of consignee or authorized representative to appear at a hearing. These hearings are informal meetings with the district designed to provide the respondents an opportunity to present evidence supporting admissibility of the article. Ordinarily, the respondents are allowed 10 working days to appear. However, if for some compelling reason the district determines 10 working days are insufficient, this time period may be extended. So about hearings, you understand? This is when you enter the court systems. Anyway, let's go down to 367. Sixty-seven, three sixty-seven. Okay. Okay. So three sixty-seven. Uh, Six point two seven. Okay. Pretty much did this here. Yeah, and then they get into bond actions and all this other stuff. You know, we need to have to go through all this. Anyway, let's go down to four twenty-nine. Want to cut it a little short. I have a few other things I want to do here, but this vi this video is going very long, longer than I wanted, as usual. But if you're really interested in this, this is really where it's at. This gives you complete, utter insight into what you're thinking at the FDA CTP when it comes to inspections, investigations. Because this is strictly written for an investigator, a new employee hired as an investigator. So uh, 8.4.7.6 on page 429, tobacco product samples. When collecting tobacco product samples as a result of a product complaint or adverse report investigation for sample collection, guidance, and contact, and contact Center for Tobacco Products, Office of Compliance and Enforcement. So you either it could be a complaint, like the complaints that I've sent, or it could be just an adverse report investigation. That is like, say, an investigator goes into a vape shop, buys an e-liquid, takes it back, analyzes it through labs, realizes it's adulterated, that's an adverse report. All right, one more page here we'll go to. 438. Uh, 8.6.3. And this 8. 8. 6.3 FDA 457 routing. Submit all FDA 457 ZISO forms to your supervisor for review, assignment, or routing as indicated. And this is where we fall at under here. Tobacco product surveillance. Submit a copy of FDA 457 to the Center for Tobacco Products Office of Compliance and Enforcement. The key word in here is surveillance. That is undercover 
investigations. They, they have surveillance of your vape shop, online, offline, whatever have you, importers across the board. So there's many other areas of this 539-page uh, document. Now, of course, it's not just tobacco products. They also deal with drugs. They deal with food. They deal with everything in this particular document. This manual is an employee manual. You can obtain it as well. Just put it in your Google. But anyway... Hopefully you realize now that there are investigations going on in the year 2017. And we won't know about them until the year 2018. And then any investigations that will be going on in the year 2018, we won't know until 2019. So by the time 2019 is up, wow. I'm telling you, it's going to reshape. I'm telling you, it'll take all time, but they're going to do it. I'm telling you. You think, ah, they're not going to do it. Ah, I don't see anything. I don't see anything going on. They don't write these employee manuals just for the heck of it. They don't just do it for the heck of it. What they did to the food industry, what they've done to the drug companies, they are going to do to us. What they have done to the combusted cigarette companies, big tobacco, they are going to do to us as well, to the vaping industry. And as soon as you wake up to that fact and accept it as a reality, then you realize that, you know, we might have a four or five year extension, but... Um, we will wind up with a very limited vaping industry, very limited vaping market, maybe even to the point of a de facto ban. They have, they have all the knowledge. They have all the experience. They have all the resources. They have all the tools. They got se over 17,000 employees. Believe me, they are some, this is an extremely serious agency, federal agency of the federal government. They have enabling powers. And what that means is they can enforce it anytime they like on anyone, on anyone through the Homeland Security, through the Custom Border Protection Services, through the alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, as well as state governments and local governments, through third parties, as well as directly with state agencies. They could give you FDA warning letters, or they don't even have to by law. Or maybe they'll give you an untitled letter to be nice if it's such a if, if the infraction is not so severe. Like something like let's say an undercover investigator goes into a vape shop and he sees that someone says that e liquid he's overhearing this, or it's even directed at the investigator, but the, 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 the vape shop employer or employer doesn't know it's the it's an investigator. And the employee or employer says that vaping is healthier for you than cigarettes, uh, tobacco. Probably you'll get an untitled uh, letter on that, a citation, on the spot or in the mail, or through email even for that matter. But mail, usually it's through the USPS. But if you're doing something like selling e-liquid to an undercover agent that you don't know it's undercover agent, of course, and it's a hired 16-year-old that is buying this e-liquid, the 16-year-old is not going to vape on it, but is going to buy it and walk out the shop and have it analyzed. Not only are you in trouble, you'll definitely get an FDA warning letter or maybe not even get one, but 
probably you will. Generally speaking, normally you get an FDA warning letter. And then they test it as well to see if it's adulterated or misbranded. Misbranded means something like it says uh, three milligrams, but it's really nine milligrams. Or it could be adulterated. Maybe, you know, some contamination in the e liquid. It says it's coconut chocolate. So I don't know who's going to vape coconut chocolate. I certainly wouldn't do it myself. Let's say it says coconut chocolate, but it's really, I don't know, um, tobacco um, alcohol in there. Yeah. Or maybe the VG is not up to pour. Maybe it's a very weak VG. Or whatever it may be. Maybe there's some strange additive in there. Or maybe like something like Dr. Crimmy's lab, his old lab that he had. Maybe they find a wing of a uh, of a house fly in the e-liquid that's what actually flies in those pictures or maybe they find hairs inside of the e-liquid or an eyelash inside of the e-liquid or any of that or maybe it's no good maybe it's the e-liquid's five years old or diacetyl or aquiline or all these chemicals in the e-liquid. Well, you're going to wind up with even more charges outside of you know, selling the e-liquid to someone under the age of 18. So anyway, I know this video went on about two hours. Uh, I didn't want it to go to two hours, but it wound up going about two hours. But this is a very serious situation and do not under any circumstances think that the fda ctp doesn't have the resources or not or or are not going to investigate they are in fact they are now investigating we just don't know about it until the year 2018. But don't take my word for it. Just look at this thing here. This thing is 539 pages long. This is for an FDA newly hired employee. They study this. They learn this. They apply this. You think they just wrote it for, well, Today, I think I'm just going to write a manual. I have nothing else to do with my time. No, they actually apply everything that's in this document. Like I said, they've been doing it with the food industry for decades. They've been doing a big tobacco for decades. They've been doing it for big pharma for decades. And now we're off the bat. Anyway, get the gist. Hopefully you realize how serious this situation really is. And uh, I have a couple other videos I was going to do, but I'm going to hold them off till tomorrow so I can rest a little bit here. And you guys have a good one. Bye.